you're going to probably see if copper rallies, you're going to see gold miners buy copper miners. And it's already happened starting last year. If they're saying that you that gold is gold is going to move with copper this time, and they're saying to you that copper's got a good chance of moving, or it's copper's time is now, then you know, silver's time is going to be bigger than that. Now, I'm not trying to pump you up, except to say they these are this is a very well written, well argued report that, of course, is biased bullish, but they're not making stories up. During the recent rally in gold and silver, renowned analyst Vince Lancy highlights Goldman Sachs's updated year end gold target to twenty three hundred dollars, suggesting that this move will reactivate dormant ETF buying. This marks the third increase in their target since the beginning of the year. Goldman Sachs's decision comes as gold surpassed its all-time high in March, following a record high reached in December last year. Previously, Goldman Sachs had predicted gold to end the year at $2,090 and then $2,180. Still, they have revised their expectations upward, considering the metal's performance has exceeded both figures. Throughout 2023, the Federal Reserve implemented a fiscal tightening campaign to combat inflation. This strategy had a notable impact on investment activity. It contributed to the strength of certain haven assets, including gold, which reached a new landmark value by the end of the year. However, the market's focus shifted to anticipating interest rate cuts, leading to stagnation at the beginning of 2024. This lull was short-lived as gold surged to a brand new all-time high in March. Vince Lancy anticipates that dip buyers will emerge ahead of the Federal Open Market Committee meeting and suggests that market behavior could shift following the meeting. The upcoming inflation data is expected to provide valuable insight into the trajectory of discussions. Furthermore, market participants will closely scrutinize Fed Chair Jerome Powell's statement following the central bank's March decision regarding interest rate cuts to indicate future policy direction. Lancy observes that silver is displaying its dynamics apart from gold indicating it responds to a distinct set of factors. Silver's price demonstrated strength on Friday, marking significant gains of over 1.40%, even as gold saw declines for two consecutive days. Join us as we delve into insights shared by Vince Lancy. To stay updated with our latest uploads, subscribe to our channel and activate notifications. Thank you. This is the weekly gold chart. See that? That's a December 3rd high. That was tested, violated, and held here. Now, if you look at it on a daily basis, you'll see that this has been tested. Well, that's the line going there. Almost tested multiple times. So there's buying, there's buying, there's buying, there's buying, there's buying, but it's a little lower. You should be bullish above that line, neutral below that line, and bearish below that line if you see something that it comes back to the line and fails on a retest. Uh, it would go down as low as 2077 if that's the case. Uh, but this is the consolidation that Goldman is predicting. Now, FOMC is this week. I think you'll have dip buyers going into the FOMC. After the FOMC, all bets are off. Silver. Silver is um, its own animal right now. Thank goodness, right? So these lines here, uh, this line, that's where I think we go to. We had a run up, or I said we'd have a run up, and we we, we skated them with the ice patch. We ice patch to here, and now we're here. Above this line is a big contentionary. So this is another volatile dead zone. You don't want to be bullish or bearish in here. You want to be watching with popcorn. But below here, you're saying to yourself, this market could be topping out. If gold breaks out, I'm going to buy silver. That's how I look at it. I'm not saying I'm going to trade it that way. But right here, I'm not saying to be short. I'm just saying this is the area that it was supposed to stop at. So is it the top of a range that goes back down here and we start to work in here for a while? Or is it a gap up that's going to start getting crazy in here? We don't know. We know what we hope, but we don't know. Uh, going back to gold for another second, I want to show you the uh, RSI. The RSI was overbought. It is starting to work itself down to less than overbought, and the market is sustaining. You want to look at things like open interest, et cetera, et cetera. The copper story is the silver story. If copper goes up, silver will go up more for this reason. That's it. And it's probably going to happen. I'm not saying it's happening tomorrow. I'm saying this report is saying to the world, we're watching. And if an opportunity presents itself, we will get long. We will tell our clients to get long and this thing will go up. And they're talking about, I mean, look at what copper and silver have done in the last week or so. They've kind of moved in tandem more so than silver and gold. Anyway, 
Gold's bullish reawakening. What does this have to do with copper, right? Well, it has a lot to do with copper. I'm not going to get into it now except to say that you're going to probably see if copper rallies, you're going to see gold miners buy copper miners. And it's already happened starting last year. But let's read this. The sharp rally in gold prices since the beginning of March has ended the period of consolidation that has been present since late December. We increased, there's a lot in here on gold. We increased our average gold forecast for 2024 from 2090 an ounce to 2180 an ounce, targeting a, targeting a move to 2300 a troy ounce by year end. Now, this is embedded in the copper report. Look, if they're saying that you that gold is gold is going to move with copper this time, and they're saying to you that copper's got a good chance of moving, or it's copper's time is now, then you know, silver's time is going to be bigger than that. Now, I'm not trying to pump you up, except to say they these are this is a very well written, well argued report that of course is biased bullish, but they're not making stories up. Stagflation plagued the U.S. economy throughout the 1970s and early 1980s. However, despite concerns about a potential return to stagflation, current market conditions do not appear to align with this narrative, according to Vince Lancey. Despite warnings from analysts like Michael Hartnett of Bank of America, Lancey suggests that the present market dynamics do not yet reflect the characteristics of stagflation. While Hartnett emphasizes the growing signs indicating a shift towards stagflation, Lancey's perspective offers a contrasting view, indicating that the market still needs to embrace the scenario. Hartnett reported that in the past year, consumer prices climbed by 3.2%, and forecasts predict that the growth rate could reach 3.6% by June. And it's not just an American dilemma. Central banks are already holding off on plans to lower interest rates in several emerging markets. Let's get back to the interview. You can see it, bond investors who were once convinced that the Fed would start cutting interest rates are painfully surrendering to a higher for longer reality. Okay, so the market is slowly saying there's going to be less rate cuts. Uh, NVIDIA, story about NVIDIA there. Investors poured a record amount into U.S. equity funds last week. That's right, a lot of them bought tech. So this stagflation story, which you'll hear come from me, as well as Hartnett, does not seem to be playing out right now. Uh, so the only thing I think that's really interesting uh, for me is... Um, SpaceX is building a network of hundreds of spy satellites under a classified contract with the U.S. intelligence agency, demonstrating deepening ties between billionaire entrepreneur Elon Musk's space company and national security agencies. Look, this whole Musk versus deep state thing, you know, it may be at the bureaucratic level of this, but the, the man's too important for, for the military industrial complex. Don't be surprised if you start seeing uh, generals driving around cyber trucks soon. Anyway, geopolitics, there's a lot of them, as I mentioned, and I'm, they're all at the bottom. And I'm not saying that they're very important, but I wanted to include them in case one of them is important. But I think the most pertinent ones are this one, these Russian, Predis and Putin won 88% of the votes in the Russian election, where the opposition was banned, according to the FT. Russian President Putin commented on the French proposal for a ceasefire during the Olympics in which he stated that they are ready for talks and will proceed from Russia's interest on the front line. Uh, White House commented the Russian election was not free, was not free nor fair. Okay, data on deck, busy data week, uh, starts slow, gets big, and then falls off the table. So Monday, home builder confidence. Tuesday, housing starts, pretty important. Wednesday, hugely important. The FOMC interest rate decision, and at 2.30, they have a conference after that. On Thursday, initial jobless claims, that happens every week. PMI, remember PMIs are what they're looking at right now, right? And US LEI, leading indicators, and existing home sales. So Wednesday and Thursday are huge days. Friday, take a breather. A city analyst suggests that aggressive purchases by central banks, coupled with the specter of stagflation and a looming global recession, could propel gold prices nearly 50% higher. Given these insights, how do you perceive the outlook for gold and silver investments? Share your thoughts in the comment section. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.